Welcome to Fortune Forecast. I am Daisy and you are in my book playlist. We are going through the book titled The Book of Life, written by Upton Sinclair, published in 1921 by the Payne Book Company in Chicago, and it is in the public domain. So we have been reading part two, and this book has four parts with various chapters in it. So part two is titled The Book of the Body. And we are now ready to jump into the next chapter, which is titled More About Health. And before I get into that, if you're new to my channel, welcome. So glad you found us and to our Fortune community. Thank you so much for your support. So if you're ready, I'm ready. Chapter 23, More About Health. Discusses the subjects of breathing and ventilation, clothing, bathing, and sleep. In discussing the question of health, we have given the greater part of the space to the subject of diet for the reason that experience has convinced us that diet is two-thirds of health and that nearly always in disease you find errors of diet playing a part. There are, however, other important factors of health now to be discussed. Everything of which the body makes use is taken in the form of food and drink, with the exception of one substance, the oxygen we get out of the air. Every time we draw a breath, we take in a certain amount of oxygen, and every time we expel a breath, we drive out a certain amount of gas called carbon dioxide, which is what the body makes of the fuel it burns. The body can get along for several days without water and for two or three months without food, but it can only get along for two or three minutes without oxygen. It should be obvious that when the body expels carbon dioxide with a slight mixture of other more poisonous gases and sucks back what it expects will be a fresh supply of oxygen, it wants to get oxygen and not the same gases it has just expelled, nor gases which have been expelled from the lungs of other people. In the days when primitive man lived outdoors, he did not have to think about this problem. He breathed poison from his lungs, the moving air of nature blew it away, and the infinite vegetation of nature took the carbon dioxide and turned it back into oxygen. And even when man built himself shelters, he was not cunning enough to make them airtight. He had to leave a big hole for the smoke to get out and smaller holes through which to get light. But now our wonderful civilization has solved these problems. We make our walls of airtight plaster and we have invented substance which will admit light without admitting air. So we have the white plague of tuberculosis and so we have innumerable minor plagues of coughs and colds and sore throats. In the summertime, the solution of the problem is easy. Have as many doors and windows in your home as possible and keep them open and have nothing in your home to make dust or to retain dust. But then comes stormy and cold weather and you have to close your doors and windows and keep your home at a higher temperature than the air outside. How shall you do this and at the same time get a continual supply of fresh air? I will take the various methods of heating one by one. The problem in each case is simple and can be made clear in a sentence or two. First, the open fireplace. This is a perfect solution if you have enough fuel and do not have to worry about the waste of heat. An open fireplace draws out all the air in the room in a short time and you do not have to bother about opening doors or windows. You may be sure that the air is getting in through some cracks or else the fire would not burn. Second, a wood or coal or gas stove in the room provided with a proper vent so that all the gases of combustion are drawn up the chimney. This changes the air more slowly than an open fireplace, but it does the work fairly well. All that you have to be careful about is that your vent is sufficiently large and is working properly. If your fire does not draw, you will have smoke or coal gas in the house, and this is bad for the lungs. But worse for the lungs is 
a gas that you can neither see nor smell nor taste, the deadly carbon monoxide. This gas is produced by incomplete combustion, and whenever you see yellow flames from gas or coal, you are apt to have this poisonous substance. Small quantities of it are sufficient to cause violent headaches, and repeated doses of it are fatal. Men who work in garages which are not properly ventilated run this risk all the time, because carbon monoxide is one of the products of imperfect combustion in the gas engine. Next, the furnace. A furnace sends fresh warm air into your house. The only trouble is that it takes out all the moisture, and some authorities say this is bad for the lungs and throat. I do not know whether this is true, but all furnaces are supposed to have a water chamber to supply moisture to the air and you should keep a pan of water on every stove or radiator in your house. Next, steam heat, which includes hot water heating. This is one of the abominations of our civilization and one of the methods by which our race is committing suicide. There is nothing wrong about steam heat in itself. The room is warmed in a harmless way. But the trouble is it stays warm only so long as the doors and windows are kept shut. You are in an airtight box and can be warm provided you do not mind being suffocated. The moment you open a door or window, you have a cold draft on your feet. And if you wish to change the air entirely, you have to let out all the heat. So of course, you never do change it entirely, but go on breathing the same air over and over. Every time you breathe it, the condition of your body is a little more reduced. The solution of this problem is not to heat the air in the room, but to use your steam coils to heat fresh air and then drive this air already warmed into the room, at the same time providing a vent through which the old air can be pushed out. This is the hot air system of heating, and it requires some kind of engine or dynamo and therefore is expensive. It has been installed in a few office buildings and theaters. One of the most perfect systems I ever inspected is in the building of New York Stock Exchange, where the air is warmed in winter and cooled in summer and freed from dust and exactly the right quantity is supplied. It is a humorous commentary upon our civilization that we take perfect care of the breathing apparatus of our stock gamblers, but pay no attention to the breathing apparatus of our senators and congressmen, whose one business in life is to use their lungs. The stately old building, which its white marble domes looks impressive in moving pictures and on illustrated postcards, but it has no system of ventilation whatever, and is a death trap to the poor wretches who are compelled to spend their days and sometimes their nights within its walls. This contrast is one symptom of the rise of industrial capitalism and the collapse of political democracy. We have reserved to the last a method of heating which is the worst and can only be described as a crime against health. The use of gas and oil stoves sit out in the middle of the room without a vent and discharging their fumes into the room. These stoves are simply instruments of slow death and their manufacture should be prohibited by law. In the meantime, what you have to do is to refuse to live in a room or to work in an office where such stoves are used. I have heard dealers insist that this or the other kind of gas or oil stove was so contrived as to consume all the fumes. Do not let anybody fool you with such nonsense. There has never been any form of combustion devised which consumes all the fumes. No such thing can be, because the products of combustion are not combustible. The so-called wickless blue flame stoves do burn all the oil, and a properly regulated gas stove will burn all the gas. But that simply means that it turns the oil and gas into carbon dioxide, the very substance which your lungs are working day and night to get out of your body. Moreover, there is no oil or gas stove which ever burns perfectly all the time, either because there is too much gas or insufficient air. Oil and gas stoves sometimes give a partly yellow flame. You can cause them to give a yellow flame at any time by blowing air against them 
and that yellow flame means imperfect combustion and a probability of the deadly carbon monoxide. These facts are known to every chemist and to every student of hygiene, and the fact that civilized people continue to burn such oil and gas stoves in their homes and offices is simply one more proof that our civilization values human welfare and health at nothing whatever in comparison with profits. Not merely should you see that you have a continuous supply of fresh air in your home, you should try to keep down dust in your home and especially fine particles of lint. Once upon a time, our ancestors were unable to make houses and floors tight, and so they put rugs on the floors and hung tapestries on the walls to keep out the wind. We civilized people are able to make both floors and walls absolutely tight, and yet we continue to use rugs and curtains, it being the first principle of our education that propriety requires us to continue to do things which our ancestors did. I am unable to think of a more silly or stupid thing in the world than a rug or a curtain, but I have lived in the house with them all my life because, alas, the ladies cannot be happy otherwise. They want their homes to be pretty, and so they continue to set dust traps and to set themselves futile jobs of house cleaning and shopping. Not all of us are able to be out of doors as much as we ought to be, but all of us spend seven or eight hours out of every 24 in sleep, and this time at least we ought to spend out of doors. I understand that this is futile advice to give to the very poor, poor myself for many years and had to put all my clothes on at night in order to keep warm and even then I could not always do it. Nevertheless, from the time I first realized the importance of ventilation, I never slept in a room with a closed window. I say, sleep outdoors if you possibly can. You do not have to be afraid of exposure, for cold will not hurt you if you keep your body in proper condition. I have slept out in a rubber blanket with the rain beating on my head and face. I have spread a rubber blanket on a hammock in the midst of a swamp and waked up in the morning with my hair and face soaked in cold white fog, but I never caught cold from such things. There is no harm, whatever, in dampness or in night air, if you are in proper condition. Of course, you may get your ears frostbitten in the middle of winter. You can have a sleeping hood to remove that danger. The nature cure enthusiasts who lay so much stress upon an outdoor life also insist that the wearing of clothes is a harmful civilized custom. They urge us to take sun baths and to ventilate the skin. Now, as a matter of fact, the skin does not breathe. It merely gives out moisture and it does not give out any less because we have clothing on us, provided the clothing is dry and clean and will absorb moisture. But by and by, the clothing becomes loaded with the waste substance given out by the skin, and then it will absorb no more. And if you do not change your clothing, no doubt it may have some effect upon health. But the principal evil of civilized clothing is that it binds the body and prevents the free play of the muscles, and more important yet, stops the free circulation of the blood. I have already discussed hats, which are the principal cause of baldness. I will go to the other extremity of the body and mention tight shoes, which, strange as it may seem, cause headaches and colds. You will be able to find a few civilized men with normal feet, but you will hardly ever find a woman whose toes are not crowded together and misshapen. I have said that the human body is one organism and that it is fed and its health maintained by the bloodstream. I say now that the circulation of the blood is one thing and if you block it at any one place, you block it everywhere. Of course, not all the bloodstream goes down into the feet, but some of it does and if it is clogged in the feet and the blood vessels cramped and crowded, there is a certain amount of poison kept in the system, which the system should have got rid of. Why do women wear tight shoes? Because the leisure class members of their sex have been kept in harems and used as the playthings of men. To be fragile and delicate was the thing admired by the masters of wealth, 
and to have small hands and feet was a sign that women belonged to this parasite class. Therefore, at all hazards, women's feet must be kept small, even at the expense of their health and happiness. And so they put themselves up on several inches of heels, which caused them to toddle around like marionettes on a stage, with all their toes crowded down into a lump. Why do men wear tight bands around their scalps, which cause their hair to drop out, and tight, stiff columns around their necks, which stop the circulation of the blood into their heads and cause them to have headaches instead of ideas? The reason is that for ages, the rulers of the tribe have wished to demonstrate publicly their superiority to the common herd, which does the menial tasks. In England, all gentlemen wear tall black silk band boxes on their heads, and in America, they have a choice among several varieties of round, tight boxes. All men who work in offices wear stiffly starched collars and cuffs as a means of demonstrating their superiority to the common workers who have to sweat at their necks. I think it is not too much to hope that when class exploitation is done away with, we shall also get rid of these class symbols and choose our clothing because it is warm and comfortable and not according to the perverted imbecilities of style. The skin gives out perspiration, which is greasy. Also, the skin is constantly growing, putting out layers of cells which dry up and are worn off. We need to bathe with soap to remove the grease, and we need to rub with a towel to brush away the dead cells of the skin, so that the pores may be kept open. No one is taking care of his body who does not wash and rub it once every 24 hours, and once or twice a week with warm water and soap. It is often stated that hot baths are weakening, but I never found it so. However, I think it is a bad practice to pamper the body, which should be accustomed to the shock of cold water. The rule as to bathing, both as to temperature and time, is simple. If, after the bath and rub down your body has reacted, you feel vigorous and fresh, that bath has done you good. If, on the other hand, you feel chilled and depressed, then you have been too long in the water or its temperature was too low. Every person has to find his own rules in such matters. The only general rule is that as one grows older, body reacts less quickly. All day, as we work and think, we store up more poisons in our cells than the body can get rid of, and the time comes when the cells are so loaded with poisons that we have to stop for a while and let our bloodstream clean house. The quantity of sleep one needs is a problem like that of cold water. Each person has to find his own rule. In general, one needs less and less sleep as one grows older. Infants sleep the greater part of the time. Growing children should sleep 10 or 11 hours, adults 7 or 8, and old people, unless they have let themselves get fat, generally do not want to sleep more than 6 and part of this in short naps. When you sleep, your bodily energies relax, and you make less heat. Therefore, you need extra clothing. But this clothing should never cover the mouth and nose, nor should it be so heavy as to make breathing a burden. If you are in good condition, it will do you no harm to be chilly when you sleep, except that you do not sleep so soundly. Sleeping too much is just as harmful as sleeping too little. Nature will tell you that. The important thing, as in all other problems of health, is to have something interesting to think about, some exciting work to do in the world, and then you will sleep as little as you have to. End of chapter 23. We're going to continue right on to chapter 24 in this video. So if you could be kind, hit that like button that favors the YouTube algorithm. And if you like this content, please do share it with your friends. All right, if you're ready, I'm ready. Let's move on to chapter 24, work and play. Deals with the question of exercise, both for the idle and the overworked. 
in discussing the important question of exercise, there is one fundamental fact to begin with. That our present civilization divides men sharply into two classes, those who do not get enough exercise and those who get too much. Obviously, it would be folly to make the same recommendation to the two classes. I begin with those who get too much exercise. They include a great number, probably the majority of those who do the manual work of the world. They include the farmers and the farmhands who work from dawn to sunset and sometimes by lantern light. They include also the farmer's wives, the kitchen slaves of whom the old couplet tells, quote, man's work ends from sun to sun, but woman's work is never done, end quote. I am aware that men have worked that way for countless ages, and yet the race is still surviving. But I am aware also that men wither up with rheumatism and contract chronic diseases of the kidneys and the blood vessels consequent upon the creation of greater quantities of fatigue poisons than the body can regularly eliminate. I have very little interest in the past, and none whatever in finding fault with it. My purpose is to criticize the present for the benefit of the future, and therefore I say that modern machinery and the whole development of modern large-scale production make it absolutely unnecessary that women should slave all their waking hours in kitchens or that men should slave all day. I say it is a monstrous folly that men should work for 12-hour stretches in street mills and for 10 and 11 hours in factories and mines. Organized labor has adopted the slogan, quote, eight hours for work, eight hours for sleep, eight hours for play, end quote. But my slogan is, quote, four hours for work, four hours for study, eight hours for sleep, and eight hours for play, end quote. I know and am prepared to demonstrate to any thinking man that modern civilization can produce not merely all the necessities but all the comforts of life for every man, woman, and child in the community by the expenditure of four hours a day work of the adult, able-bodied men and women. So to all the wage slaves of the factories and mines, the fields and the kitchens, I say that too much exercise is what is the matter with you, and what you need is to get off in quiet nook in the woods and read a good novel, not merely for a few hours, but for a few months, until you get over the effects of capitalist civilization. I know that not many of you can get away as yet, but I urge you to insist upon getting away, to fight for the chance to get away, and I will here suggest a few of the novels for you to read when finally you do get away. I choose the easy ones, which the dullest and most tired of you will love. I say, make up your mind to read these 32 books before you die, and do not let the world cheat you out of your chance. Mark Twain, a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. Charles D. Stewart, the fugitive blacksmith. W. Clark Russell, the wreck of the Grosvenor. R. L. Stevenson, Treasure Island, kidnapped. Jack London, The Sea Wolf, The Call of the Wild, Martin Eden. Joseph Conrad, Youth. H. G. Wells, The War of the Worlds. When the Sleeper Wakes, The Sea Lady, The History of Mr. Polly, The Food of the Gods, The Island of Dr. Moreau. Upton Sinclair, The Jungle. King Cole, Jimmy Higgins, 100%. Theodore Drazer, Sister Carrie. George Moore, Aster Waters. Frank Norris, The Octopus. Brand Whitlock, The Turn of the Balance. D. Foe, Robinson Crusoe. Fielding, Tom Jones, Jonathan Wild the Great. Thackeray, the Adventures of Barry Lyndon, Marmaduke Pithall, The Adventures of Haji Baba, Blasco Ibanez, The Fruit of the Vine, Frank Harris, Montes the Matador, 
Frederick Van Eden, The Quest, Tolstoy, Resurrection. And now for the people who do not get enough exercise. In the armies of King Cyrus, it was the law that every man was required to sweat once every 24 hours. That is still the law for every businessman and office worker and writer of books. There is no substitute for it, and there is no health without it. I have heard Dr. Kellogg say that the modern woman sends out her health with her washing, and I have heard the leisure class ladies at the sanitarium discuss this cryptic utterance and wonder what he meant by it. I know that there is use telling leisure class ladies what exercise at the wash tub would do for their abdomens and backs. I will only tell them that unless they can find some kind of vigorous activity which keeps them in a free perspiration for an hour or two each day, they will never be ready well and will never bear children without agony and abortion. For myself, I have found that the minimum is three or four times a week. Unless I get that much hard exercise, I am soon in trouble. So my advice to the businessman is to take off his coat and collar and turn out and help his truckman. My advice to the white collar slave is to get a part time job and dig ditches the rest of the time. To the man who has cares which pursue him, and likewise to the ardent student and brain worker, I say that they should find not merely exercise but play. The distinction between the two things is important. There can be play that is not exercise, for example, cards and chess, and of course, there can be exercise that is not play. What you must have is something that is both play and exercise, something that not merely causes your heart to beat fast and your lungs to pump fast and your sweat glands to throw out poisons from your body, but something that fully occupies your mind and gives your higher brain centers a chance to relax. Our civilization has very largely destroyed the possibility of play and the spirit of play. We civilized people no longer know what play is and regard the desire to play as something abnormal, a form of vice. We allow children to play after school hours and on Saturdays, but for grown-up, serious-minded men and women to want to play would be almost as disreputable as for them to want to get drunk. What could be more pitiful than the spectacle of tens of thousands of men crowding into our baseball parks and amusement fields to watch other men play for them? Imagine, if you can, a crowd of people gathering in a restaurant or theater to watch other people eat for them. Imagine yourself, a man from Mars, coming down to a world with so many people in want and finding whole classes of men forbidden to do any work under penalty of disgrace and compelled in order to exercise their muscles to pull on rubber straps and lift weights and wave dumbbells and Indian clubs in the air. Methods of expending their muscular energy which are respectable because they accomplish nothing. When I was a boy, I was fond of all kinds of games. I was a good tennis player and in the country an incessant hunter and fisherman. When on the city streets we boys could not find any other game to play, we would get up on the roofs of the houses and throw clothespin and snowballs at dagos working in the nearby excavations. So we had the fine game of being chased by the dagos with the chance, real or imaginary, of having a knife stuck into us. But then as I grew older and because aware of the pain and misery of the world, I lost my interest in games. And for ten years or so I never played. I did nothing but study and write. So my health gave way, and I had the problem of restoring it. And I spent some twenty years wrestling with this problem before I thoroughly convinced myself on the point that there can be no such thing as sound and permanent health without a certain amount of play. I don't think there is any kind of hard physical work I failed to try in the course of my experiments. I rode horseback and took long walks, and climbed mountains, and swam, and dug gardens, and chopped down whole groves of trees, and cut them up, and carried them to the fireplace. I have done this latter work for a whole winter in the country, several hours every day, and it has done my health no good to speak of. I have been ready for a breakdown at the end of it. 
The reason is that all the time I was doing these things with my body, I was going right on working my brain. While I was swimming or climbing a mountain or galloping on horseback, I was absorbed in the next chapter of the book I was writing, so that I literally did not know where I was. I would make up my mind that I would not think about my work and would make desperate efforts not to do so, but it was like walking along the edge of a slippery ditch. Sooner or later, I was bound to fall in and go floundering along, unable to get out again. And the same thing applies to all gymnastic work. I have experimented with a dozen different systems of exercises and with all kinds of water treatments. I have used dumbbells and Indian clubs and Swedish gymnastics, McFadden's exercises in bed, and the yogi breathing exercises, and more kinds of queer things than I can remember now. But for me, there's only one solution of the problem, which is to have an antagonist. It may be a deer I'm trying to shoot or some trout I'm trying to lure out of their holes. It may be some boys I'm trying to beat at football or hockey, or it may be the game I know best and find most convenient, which is tennis. If it is tennis, then it has to be someone who can make me work as hard as I know how. For if it is someone I can beat easily, why? Before I have been playing 10 minutes, I'm busily working on the next chapter of a book or answering letters I have just got in the mail. Recently, I came upon a book the Psychology of Relaxation by Dr. Patrick, in which the theory of this is set forth. Civilized man is working, his higher brain centers more than his body can stand. His brain is running away with him, absorbing a constantly increasing share of his energies. True relaxation is only possible where the higher brain centers are lulled and the back lobes of the brain brought into activity. One of the means of doing this is alcohol, and that is why, through the ages, all races of men have craved to get drunk. There is a method which is harmless and does not break down the system, and that is play. When we become really interested in play, we are as children, as a primitive man. We do all the things that our race used to do many ages ago. We hunt and fight. We pit our wits against the wits of our enemies and struggle with desperation to get the better of them. If our play is physical play, if we are absorbed in a game or bodily contest, then we are exerting and developing all those portions of us which civilization tends to atrophy and deaden. There are people who will dispute with you about socialism, ask how we are going to provide incentives if we do away with wage slavery. When you tell them that activity is natural to human beings and that if there were no work, men and women would have to make some, they shake their heads mournfully and tell you about the problem of human nature. But consider games and sports. Men do not have to work their bodies, yet they go out and deliberately hunt for trouble. They invent themselves subtle and complicated games and are not content until they find people who can beat them at it or, at any rate, can make them work to the limit of their strength until they are in a dripping perspiration, and thoroughly exhausted. I may be too optimistic about human nature, but I believe that this is the attitude every normal human being takes toward the powers, both mental and physical, which he possesses. He wants to use them, and for all they are worth. If you don't believe it, just take any group of youngsters, give them a baseball and a bat, turn them loose in a vacant lot, and watch them choose up sides and fall to work, screaming and shouting in wild excitement. There are some races of the earth which do not yet know baseball, but the Filipinos and the Japanese have learned it, and even the war-worn Palu and the supercilious Tommies condescended to experiment with it. And if you think it is only physical competition that young human animals enjoy, try them at putting on a play or printing a magazine, or conducting a debate, or building a house, anything whatever that involves healthy competition and is related to the big things of life, but without being for the profit of some exploiter. Get clear the plain and simple distinction between work and play. Play is what you want to do, while work is what the profit system makes you do. And we have reached to the end of chapter 24, let's move on to the next video where I will be there with chapter 25. Hit that like, subscribe to the channel.